then we'll kick off talking about universal design for learning and we're going to be thinking about how we can help sustain student effort and persistence. This has been one of the big buzzwords that we've been hearing at CAST and universal design for learning is like, especially in these remote times, how can we get students to really persist and put forth effort and you might even be thinking about your own self. You know, this is a very different, um, we're coming up on a fall with a very different context for us as educators. How can you help sustain your own effort and persistence as we move into these really unusual times? Um, so our goals for today are really, I, my background is in mind, brain, and education. I'm gonna talk about and share about the learning brain and think about how we can take some of what we know about the learning brain to really think about how we can support this effort and persistence. So I do wanna invite you um, to share just a couple things, either one, maybe share what's your goal for this session. I know you had a number of options for where to go. What's something you hope to learn or gain? Or maybe you wanna share what was a time you really kind of surprised yourself and sustained effort and persistence? What might've been hard about that? So just take a moment, reflect on your goals and reflect on a time you sustained effort and persistence and what was hard about that. And you can share to, to Twitter if you'd like, you can share in the chat box. If you wanna to go to that Google doc, you can feel free to go there as well. I'll give you just a moment to share. Yeah, thank you for sharing that even this summer has been a lot of effort and persistence. You maybe didn't get the break that you're used to getting and here you got to just kind of keep going and turn it on again for the fall. Feeling all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Looking to get great ideas for developing lessons that lead to deeper learning. This is fabulous. Looks like we have a nice range of um, kindergarten, you know, uh, elementary, middle, and high school students. Lots of different content areas. Sustained effort and persistence during a keynote. Yep, you may have to sustain effort and persistence during this. I hope you don't. I please feel free to move as you need to, eat as you need to, do things you need to self-regulate. Excellent, thank you all for taking a moment to reflect on that. Um, I actually thought that I, I'd, I'd kick off this morning and just share a little story because hopefully, you know, stories are really powerful ways to share and communicate. And um, I, I invite you to think about this, the key theme is going to be brain plasticity. Think also about what resonates or surprises you, but also think about how you can apply this to your practice, whether you work with adults, young kiddos, any age, and how can this really help deepen our thinking about this effort and persistence, sustaining this effort and persistence? Um, and it's a very drafty draft story. So I'm kind of sharing, you know, with you some of like my behind the scene thinking of what's going on as I'm trying to, to craft this, um, this story. So here it goes, you ready? <laughs> Drum roll. Uh, so when I was in school, I never received an official learning diagnosis. Uh, I didn't, you know, meet criteria for dyslexia, ADHD, gifted, none of it. But I, I always thought I kind of needed some sort of label because I didn't seem to learn like everyone else. So for example, I really struggled in multiple choice tests because I really like to explain the connections between all of them instead of looking for a single right answer. It's not good for multiple choice. I also like bulleted, I remember really struggling in seventh grade, the teacher was teaching us how to do bulleted outlines. And I was like, but you could organize it like this or like this. And I really prefer to make big messy maps. In fact, I even look at my notes and they're just these big messy pieces of paper that are sprawled all over the place. Um, and in college, I discovered this awesome thing. I don't know if you all remember movable chalkboards. 
You remember those? You can like slide them up and down. I'm seeing some nods. So these I thought were the greatest things because I could write and draw out all of my notes on these different boards and I could just sit back and kind of make the connections and tell the stories myself. I really couldn't sit in the library like all of my friends and I felt like there was something kind of wrong with the way I was doing it. So I never told anyone that this was how I study and I always just like kind of disappear the night before an exam and go do my weird little study thing by myself and then show up the next day for the, you know, for the exam. And and I, you know, I just, I really felt like there was a right way to learn and that I didn't quite do it that way. So again, I kind of invite you to think about yourself as a learner growing up, or some of you think, you know, the expectations of what the right way or the not right way is and how that can impact our, our effort and persistence. So also in college, I discovered my passion for neuroscience and read a lot of amazing stories that captivated my imagination about the brain. But it wasn't until years later, like 10 years into my teaching career that I was like, whoa, these stories actually hold tremendous implications for the way, uh, the creative opportunities that we can have to support the different way students learn. And this can really support their effort and persistence because it turns out, not going to be, I don't think, a big surprise for you, but it was for me. We each learn differently, and there is no right way to do it. And so let me share one example of a story that just really captivated my imagination still to this day, and I think applies to online learning. Um, so Cheryl is a woman who is 37 years old, and she received an antibiotic after a routine hysterectomy. But the dosage of the antibi antibiotic was not quite right, and it actually damaged the little hairs on the inside of her inner ear. And it does, may not seem like a big deal, like these hairs are tiny, but it turns out that even in order to balance, you need these little hair cells. So without them, Cheryl couldn't even sit upright on her own. She would have to cling to walls and chairs to even hold herself up. So she was then confined to her house. She lost her job. She wasn't able to drive. And the really scary part was that this condition was labeled as permanent. There was no cure. She was 37 years old. But fortunately for Cheryl, she was able to work with a neuroscientist named Baki Rita, who really understood brain plasticity. And you've probably heard this idea that the brain is flexible, it's malleable, it can grow. And you might think, you know, oh, this is for, for young kids and maybe this doesn't apply to me, but it turns out we all have this amazing brain plasticity. So a famous study, and I'm seeing some of you not may know, like musicians, if they start to play a piece of music very rapidly with their fingers, literally areas of their cortex involved in mapping finger movement will grow in just a matter of days. And these are adults, right? These are adults that this growth happens. And then when you stop playing that music, it shrinks back again. They don't you know, necessarily all go away, but the size of the cortex involved changes based on how we interact with our environment. So right now we can pause and think, you know, we've been in remote learning. I've been talking to flat humans on my screen now for five months. That has absolutely changed my brain and changed our students' brains, changed our colleagues' brains. So back to, uh, back to Cheryl. So this is the picture on the screen. With a little rudimentary materials and creativity, Baki Rita rigged this construction hat for Cheryl, literally a construction hat. And the construction hat uh, was connected to a strip of electrodes that she would put on her tongue. And the strip gave like a little tingy feeling, kind of like a little seltzer on her tongue. So when she's tilted to the right, she would feel the bubble shift and her muscles, you know, she would learn, okay, I need to correct. Or, oh, I went too far that way. She'd feel the fizz, oh, I need to correct. So her goal was to try to keep the fizzy feeling centered on her tongue. So within 30 minutes of having this thing on her tongue, she was able to stand upright independently. Like just imagine, right? Imagine that feeling. And many were like, oh, this is great. Might not have any long-term effect, but Cheryl kept practicing. And with a little work, she was able to stand independently for an hour. More work, she was able to stand independently for a day. And after a year of practice, she no longer needed to use the device at all. She was able to go about all, all of her normal before um, the damaged hair cells, all of those activities. So the sensory neurons in her tongue started to take the place of what the little tiny hair cells of her inner ear used to do. They sent the signals about her body position to her brain. And so it was through the interactions with her environment 
that Cheryl's brain changed in unique ways that were meaningful for her. And she's an adult, right? She's an adult. So in just one year, she was able to have that dramatic of a change. Think of the opportunities that we have with our learners coming up in the next year, right? I mean, and talk about effort and persistence. It changes the brain. It absolutely fundamentally changes the brain. So each of us have this remarkable brain plasticity. Our brains grow and change based on those interactions with the environment. Our neurobiology parallels our lived experiences. And so let's step back then and think about what are these experiences like for students in schools, in the hybrid, in the remote? What are these experiences like for you? You know, are the, are the learning spaces, again, whether they're digital or whether they're in the classroom, you know, how are they fostering engagement, community, high expectations, and valuing the range of backgrounds and learning preferences? Or how are the environments disengaging? and inflexible or seemingly irrelevant or seemingly something that you're not included as part of? How are students more or less expected to do the same thing at the same time? Which is not how we know that the brain, you know, the variability of our brains works. And so I'm gonna give just a simple example that I think about a lot when I think about schools. Um, you know those bulletin boards that are in the hallways and student work is posted up there? And um, it's usually like the exact same piece of work that's displayed. Everyone walking by can see them. And you know what we do, we compare them. We can't help but to do that. That's what you know, human nature does. You're like, oh, there's the poor kid with the messy handwriting or the bad spelling. And of course, you might imagine from what you already know about me, I was not in the lines. I was kind of scattered all over the place. And think of the ways that we make generalizations based on such little information. And think of the ways that we label students or that students start to label themselves based on some imaginary idea that there's the single right way of doing the assignment. And think about what those bulletin boards are in our remote environments. How does that impact student effort and persistence and their willingness to keep trying and to keep working like Cheryl had to do? I think it really matters. I think uh, the labels that we use can potentially instill fixed mindsets about what we can or can't do. And even at a young age, kids start to, start to get a sense of, I'm a poor reader, I can't do math, I'm too talkative. For me, it was that I'm shy and I'm messy. <laughs> like, was, those are my two, ex you know, I, I expected that I wouldn't participate well in conversations and that my work would be, <laughs> look, this one's not even on the back of an envelope. <laughs> my work would be messy, right? And those absolutely, those labels that I started to give myself impacted the way I engaged and persisted in school. And the older students get, I think the more fixed and rigid those can become. Because by high school, they've been hearing some of these messages and internalizing some of those for over a decade, right? For over a decade. So I wanna give you a moment to just think about this story. You know, what resonates or surprises you? What is this making you think about what you might wanna to apply to your practice? in terms of sustaining student and, and teacher effort and persistence. I'll give you a, a, just a moment to kind of reflect on what's resonating, what surprised you, how might you apply something to practice. Mm, the book, my, my Fantastic Elastic Brain. Very cool. Thinking about how to make some of this brain science explicit to students. We can do it virtually. We can do it. Oh, look at the effort and persistence. 
Timothy, you noted, you know, practicing not reacting to negative student behavior. So that's your own effort and persistence in terms of how you're responding to students. That's fabulous. It's really hard some days, especially when you're feeling behind and overwhelmed. Oh, and looking for those positive moments, like seeing students remediate persistent articulation errors, even in distance learning. Yeah, this learning is happening still, even in these remote contexts. Ooh, this is a, a, an interesting one, like thinking about organized chaos, having the perimeters, but also thinking outside the box. Awesome. Often by defining the perimeter, it helps students to go further, you know, by showing them a worked example. It helps them get it enough that they can go above and beyond. And I think for me, that's one of the biggest things to help me sustain effort and persistence is to see an example like, oh, that's what you want. I can do that instead of trying to imagine, I'm not sure what I think she wants, what is this? You kind of worry and perceive on that, maybe go down the wrong rabbit hole, like show me an example, that's what it looks like, oh, I can go above and beyond that, or I can do it this way. Having those models can really be helpful. Focusing, focusing on strengths, yes, if we start with strengths and let students know that these can be strengths, these messy maps I make, there are opportunities within them, you know, whatever those messy maps are for students. Love it, love it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press on, it'll keep sharing, keep sharing, whoops. Um, so I want to share four key ideas about the brain that I hope connect to the story about brain plasticity and learning that there's not one right way. And really, I'm going to keep trying to tie these to how learning this about the brain can help us think deeper about how to design for effort and persistence. Does that sound good? And we'll connect it to UDL in there. Okay, good. I'm seeing some head nods. All right, great, great, great. Okay, so here are the four things. We'll look at how experience really matters. Emotions are always part of learning. Our brain gets tired. <laughs> Many of you have already talked about that cognitive load. And reflection is a key piece of learning. So let's jump in. And the first, oh, oh no, it looks like some of my images aren't loading. Um, okay, um, so this had a picture of a snow hill on it. And um, the, so this first key idea about the brain is that our experiences really matter. And experience comes from a combination of nature and nurture. So I know in California, you don't get very many snow days and it's like a nice hot 100 degrees here today. So the thought of some snow seemed to really resonate for me. Let's think of something nice and cool for the summer. Um, and if you think of, um, think of a hill, oh my gosh, there are some beautiful hills in that Sonoma area. Each hill is different, right? That's kind of like us in terms of our nature. When we think of what we're born with, we're each kind of born with our own hill of neurons in our brain. And based on what we do, those hills are going to form differently. So if you imagine, you know, there's some snow on your hill and you go to sled down it. So those of you who haven't been sledding, the first time you go to sled down a hill, it's really hard. You like have to work and you're scooching the sled. And the same is kind of true for skiing. Have any of you experienced this? You're like, you're working really hard to get down the hill. And then the next time you go to sled down that same spot, you're like, ooh, I'm moving a little faster. And then the third time, it's a little faster. And then other kids are like, what's going on over there? Look how fast you're going down the hill. And that same run starts getting really fast. It goes faster and faster. And this is what starts to happen with practice and with use. So if you imagine like Cheryl's brain, initially when she was trying to use that fizzy strip, she's like working really hard. Talk about sustaining effort and persistence. Even just to hold her arm upright, like I'm doing here, took work and took effort. But over time, those literal neural pathways in her brain started to get faster and more robust. And her networks were very different from, from mine. She's using her tongue, first of all, to help get those signals. And I'm using those little you know, hairs from her inner ears. But the output, what we actually see ends up being the same. So we're all gonna do it really differently. And some students come to our classrooms, even at kindergarten, having you know, maybe read a whole lot or heard a lot of language or doing math already. And others you know, maybe came to, come to us with a lot of socialization and good empathy skills and being able to relate to each other. But we know they're gonna come to us with really different hillsides. And based on those experiences, they're gonna have different tracks that are fast and easy 
and others that they're going to have to work harder at. And it's not that their brain is broken, it's just that they maybe haven't forged those connections yet. So they're going to have to work a little bit harder. Just like us in remote learning, if we hadn't had experience with Zoom yet, the first time you get on, you're like, wait a minute, what is happening here? You all remember this, John? Where do I click? What do I do? And your brain is working really hard. It's like that first time trying to go down that snow hill, like, oh, I think I can do it. And you're totally exhausted afterwards. And now you're, you know, I'm getting a little more like, oh, let me try a breakout room. And oh, look at me. I can also do the chat and we can do this, you know, kind of getting the back and forth that, you know, you get, start to get more comfortable. Those snow hill pathways start to get faster and faster. And I'm not quite sure how to connect this to fire days, Tracy, but I'm sure there's a way we can make that connection. So when we think about this um, experience really matters, then the second, oh my goodness, I'm so, you know, I'm really kind of disappointed that my images aren't working here. Um, so in every situation, um, so I'm not sure um, um, if, if tech help is here at all, if you could help get my images, that would be great. Um, so in every, so emotions, the second key idea is that emotions matter for learning. You never have a moment where you don't have emotions. It's never like, oh, emotions are there and now I'm gonna work on cognition. It's just, they always go together. And every moment your brain is saying, wait a minute, is this good for me or bad for me? So imagine right now I say, hey, we're all gonna sing a Taylor Swift song right now together. Some of you are gonna be like, yes, this is good for me. And others of you might be like, no, this is not good for me. And we might have a couple flexible options. Like you could just mouth the words or you could just sing it to a friend or you could mute yourself. And when you start to have different options, your physiology starts to say, okay, wait a minute. Maybe this is okay for me. Or nope, that option's still not good for me. So when we start to have some flexibility in our environments, the literal appraisal of the situation changes and can get your physiology in a really positive space for learning. Because if our physiology gets too activated, if you're like, oh my gosh, I absolutely, I can't sing, I don't wanna unmute, I don't wanna, I hate Taylor Swift, I don't wanna do this, your physiology gets into a space where you don't want to put forth any effort. You're going to get no persistence. In fact, I might start to see this, you know, like all of a sudden you disappear from the screen and you're like, where did they go? Come back. <laughs> or the opposite, like if you know Taylor Swift really well and you're like, oh, I've sung this song a hundred times and you're bored, that's not a good space to be in either. So we know for every assignment, for every lesson, for everything that we're doing with our learners, you're gonna have that range of physiological activation. You know, this is good for me, this is bad for me, and anything in between. And the more you can have some flexibility in that space, and some flexibility even in the timing. Like one of you noted how um, even at the very beginning, I kind of jump started and you're like, wait a minute, I'm not ready to go yet. However, you can have some flexibility built in there. Um, that starts to make it so the physiology is like, this is okay. I'm appraising the situation as being okay for me. And remember, these could be real appraisals or they could be imagined, right? Like I might imagine that my teacher doesn't like me and so this isn't gonna go well. And so you're going to start appraising things even if that's maybe not true. So our imagined appraisal also impacts our physiology. And that can be so powerful when we think of students wanting to persist and put forth effort, especially in remote learning, which can be challenging, right? Some students will love remote learning. I know some kiddos who have done really well and some adults who have done really well. And others, it's going to be a lot harder and a lot more challenging. So really thinking about how can we have high expectations, but have some flexible options to get to those to really get our neurophysiology in a good space for, um, for learning. So are there any questions or comments with that idea? Yeah, and someone noted English language learners. Absolutely, yep, yep. I had a comment. Thank you, yes, Timothy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I always struggle to, uh, and, and uh, kind of accept the way that my son and his generation have done the gaming thing, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm seeing, because I'm always trying to find what is the adaptation that that world is bringing to that generation. And you just, you just sparked an idea that is helpful to me. And it is that when they're sitting there and they have one screen corner that is a map 
and then they have another one that is their resources and there is another one that is their activities. Mm -hmm. I can't even perceive how to do that game, <laughs> but they're doing it all at the same time. So for me to be able to chat mm -hmm. and watch you at the same time, that, that's just a thought that occurred to me and it gives me hope for the future because uh, <laughs> Looks like it's going this way. Thanks. It'll be different, right? It'll be a different way of learning and interacting. In fact, um, the, I think his name is, oh, I'm forgetting the name of the, the man who invented the word, you know, helped, helped coin the World Wide Web. Um, he had ADHD. And there's a joke. He's made us all a little more ADHD. We're like searching all over the place and going, ooh, this late, what am I searching for again? Because <laughs> you get all distracted. And, these, and now it's not so much that we have to remember the content, but we have to remember how to navigate to find it and how to kind of go, you know, go from screen to screen and place to place. And I'm looking at your faces in the chat. <laughs> it is a whole different piece. You're right. And our brains can do it. It's just going to take us some time to get there if that's the goal. And the more they've gamed, you're right. Like those neural pathways, they are sliding down fast <laughs> and it feels easy to them. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for making that. That was a very cool connection. So this brings us to actually, we were just talking about the third big thing is that learning takes energy. And this is you know, referred to as cognitive load. Our, our brain is basically a, an energy hog. And I really like this image that a friend of mine drew because it shows like the, a lot of tasks will, I mean, just literally think of it taking up space, cognitive energy in your brain. And emotions factor in that as well. So it used to be I would go to the grocery store and that actually was kind of calming for me. It helped reduce my feeling of cognitive load. Now I've got to get the mask on. I've got to stay social distance. I've got to wait in line. I don't know if I want to touch things. Oh no, I touched that banana. It's not the one I want. I don't want to touch. All of a sudden something simple, like I'm seeing people nod, you know, right? Going to the grocery store is now taking up cognitive energy. It's wearing me out. So I get home and instead of feeling refreshed and like I'm ready to work, I'm ready to make a snack, I'm like, I need a nap, <laughs> you know, I need a glass of wine. What, you know, you, so, so thinking about that cognitive load and where our students are can make such a huge difference in their, in their effort and persistence. So, you know, let's even think about something like multiplying two two-digit numbers, multi-digit numbers, you know, 64 times 128. You have to remember how to multiply single digits. You have to know how to line up your numbers. You have to handwrite your numbers in ways that you can read them. You have to carry digits. You have to placeholder. Then you have to remember to add at the end. And then if that's in a word problem and maybe you don't read English well, then you're like, wait, what am I doing? I'm now trying to read this and I'm trying to make sense of this. And there's, there is so much we have. So really like stepping back and doing a task analysis of thinking about, and actually, Timothy, you were kind of getting to it, even to get on this call, you know, I had to do this and this and this, and think about where there are barriers and think about where there are tools that we could include in that. Like, where might we, you know, let a student use a calculator to multiply six times four, and maybe that will help them or give them a graphic organizer that's charted out so they can remember how to hold and line up their zeros. You know, let them use a stamp if they have really messy handwriting and so that then handwriting is not the barrier. Where you can think of how to scaffold those not big deal things so students can focus their cognitive energy on the bigger picture. You know, what does it mean to multiply those, those two two-digit numbers to be able to get to something larger? So we can keep our focus on the rigorous, challenging pieces and scaffold kind of the little stuff. I love the example that Albert Einstein was actually awful at computation. And thank goodness he was allowed to use a calculator because then he could get to this higher level, you know, theoretical physics. What if we had, you know, early on locked him out of that and said, no, you're not going to take physics until you do this remedial math. We would have lost his brain. So really thinking about, you know, how can we add scaffolds into the environment that keep our goals rigorous and challenging and meaningful, but that really helps support this cognitive load to get through kind of the nitty gritty of the practices. So are there thoughts about how we can do this? Again, I don't have a magic answer, <laughs> but I think there are a lot of tools and strategies out there, even like sentence starters, templates, graphic organizers, model examples, worked problems, like all of these can, the, the option to be able to have a friend, you know, collaborate if you want or work on your own if you want. 
And Bethany, you've hit on the reason why I love brain science. My practice doesn't necessarily change, but the way I'm thinking about my practice and why it matters has totally shifted the more I understand the learning brain. Yes, and when you have these dual languages, it's a lot of cognitive load until those neural pathways get faster. Super cool. Oh no, right, and someone, if you're struggling with Wi-Fi right now, don't worry, the session's being recorded. You can watch it later. <laughs> There's a flexible option for you. Ooh, a deep question. Why have humans clung to the concept of discipline as education? Oh, it's a big one. I think you could write a book on that. It would be really interesting. <laughs> Fabulous. Having options and student, how students present. Okay, this has been a big one. I don't know how many of you have, have heard this, but a lot of teachers, rightly so, are saying, we need to check in social and emotionally with students at the start of class. The way it's being done, students need to go around at the start of the class and say how they're doing. Where are the barriers in that? If something, I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't mind chatting about things. I'm not gonna tell you how I'm doing right now. You don't really I, wanna know. <laughs> Let me just say one quick thing, Timothy, and then, then, so what we wanna think about is the goal is to check in around social emotional health. And how can we provide flexible options for our students to be able to share with us in different ways and in different means to be able to get to that goal of understanding how they are. Okay, Timothy, all you. <laughs> uh yeah, sorry. This is a great workshop, by the way. Thanks. Oh, good. Thanks. Um, I work with the kids that have been expelled or incarcerated. And in my last uh, year, I was with a community school, expelled kids. And one of the biggest barriers to getting them on Zoom was appropriate behavior. And I wrote down all the norms that were expected and everything, but they self-sabotaged. And they knew that if they held up their bong or, you know, Mm -hmm. or inappropriate they're going to be excluded from the meeting mm -hmm. so um do you have any tips for how to address that it's so challenging right because you think of the whole background experience if school and learning was not a safe space and their physiology comes into a learning situation and it has had years of saying this is not good for me that's going to be almost a strategic behavior if there's a tiger in a room and you walk in your best move is to get the heck out of there so if this has been the best choice for their physiology to be in a safe space, then yeah, they're making a choice to get the heck out of there. So how do we bring them back in? How do we help them understand that this is actually a place where it can be safe and that they actually want to engage in the learning? So I didn't put you there as a plant, but let me jump ahead to thinking about what the, so the UDL guidelines can be a tool for us to just spark ideas about what we, what we might try. And I focus specifically on this one around sustaining effort and persistence, but you could hop into any of them. Like if you think executive functions is the biggest barrier, hop into that UDL guideline and look at that one. You know, if you think self-regulation is the biggest barrier, hop into that one. But let's look, let's see if there's anything here in sustaining effort and persistence. So in this one, there are four things. One, it says heighten the salience of goals. So how might we at, you know, invite them to think about why this matters? You know, what's the buy-in? What's in it for you? And sometimes it's those little like, you know, sticker kind of systems, you know? Well, if you get here, you get like a point and that's gonna add up to something. That's, you know, obviously extrinsic motivation. We want it to be intrinsic, but that extrinsic might get us to some intrinsic. How could the goals be relevant and meaningful for that? The second is to vary the demands and resources. And this is not a new idea in education. This comes from the Zone of Proximal Development by Vygotsky. This comes from Shkek Smilhai, who talks about getting into that state of flow, where you have this, you know, you have a range of challenges and resources to meet the demands of a task. So when you're able to have support to scaffold your skills, and you have the, oops, sorry, and you have the right amount of challenge, you can get into that amazing flow space. How many of you have experienced flow where you kind of forget what's going on, you lose sense of time? It's magical, right? And it can happen in our schools, but students have to perceive that there are resources to go along with the demands of a task. Educators have to perceive that there are resources to go along with the demands of our profession. And that perception of resource is such a tricky one because you might say, look, I've given you five resources, but if the student doesn't think they're helpful, they're not going to use them. 
So we really have to try to work with students to think about, you know, what are some of the resources that could really help within the demands of this task. A third idea is to foster collaboration. And it doesn't mean always do group work. It really doesn't. I'm one of the kiddos, I hate group work. <laughs> no offense to my colleagues, but I'm often like, let me go do this on my own for a little bit and then I'll come to you when I need collaboration. And others are like, I wanna jump in and group collaborate at the beginning. So really thinking about fostering collaboration, fostering ways for them to know when to reach out, giving them sentence starters for how they can start dialogue and conversation and have productive conversation, and when they have the opportunity to have that independence if they need to work on their own. So thinking deeply about the opportunity to foster collaboration. And then the fourth suggestion is thinking about how we're giving feedback that's mastery oriented. So how they can know what the end product, like here's what we're looking for, you know, maybe here's something relevant in the real world and a job you're interested in. And how are you able to make progress and get feedback along the way? And I know as a teacher, I was often like, I taught high school science, I'm like, I have 142 students. It's really hard for me to give a lot of feedback along the way, but I know it's so critical. How can we offload it so the feedback isn't all on us, but it's a part of the group, you know, the group as a whole knows, here are the steps, here's the outcome, here's the rubric, here's what it looks like, and we can work with each other and we can even do self-reflection to see how we're monitoring progress on the way. And especially with young kiddos and remote learning, we need to have work with parents to be able to get some of that feedback about how they're progressing. So even developing those communication routines and norms with parents is a lot, right? It's a lot. <laughs> So there are a few suggestions. I'm not quite sure how helpful that may be for you. Um, but I do also just want to share that there are so many possible strategies out there. Um, I want you to know the UDL guideline site is there with a ton of ideas. We've created padlets for each of the UDL guidelines with strategies. Goalbook as a tool is a for fee, but they have a free UDL aligned list of resources. So I'm so, so happy to share the free things. Um, and I also find that it can be really helpful to work together. So like Timothy, in your example, I don't know if you collaborate with others, but really to brainstorm, you know, what can we open up our cabinets and you know, our metaphorical cabinets and use to really try to design these flexible options to get at our learning goals. And I've also included in here a lesson planning guide. Um, if you just want to, you know, take a look at the way that CAST is shared and kind of outline ways to lesson design, but not if that increases your cognitive load too much. <laughs> Some of you might love it and be ready and some of you might be like no thank you Allison please move on and you might even just like I've made a deal with myself I'm gonna learn I've heard about Pear Deck and Flipgrid recently and I'm gonna just try to learn those two I'm gonna sometime this fall I'm gonna try them out so that's kind of my own little personal goal for what I think I can manage in terms of my my own cognitive load um, so this was a lot I recognize that I shared a lot and I kind of hopped through um, some of the pieces but I invite you to just pause for a minute and think about you know, what's resonated, what questions you have, what's an action you'll take. Here's a quick summary of, we, of what we took a look at. And look, the fourth one, how important reflection is for learning, is the one that I skipped over. <laughs> so the brain actually works with these two parallel circuits. One is active. So like when you say pay attention, it's you know, encouraging you to focus on what's going on in the outside world in a very active way. And then when you pause, and I'm actually gonna give us 30 seconds here to pause and just have quiet. And I want you to think about how your train of thinking shifts in just 30 seconds. So here we go. So a lot of what starts to happen and see if this resonates with you is you kind of go from thinking like, oh my gosh, this is a lot and where's the audience, where's the, what's going on? And then you start to kind of 
takes take a, a toll of where you are. Like, oh, actually, I'm a little hungry, or oh, I'm sitting on my hip a little funny, or like I'm noticing right now the air conditioning is not on. I'm starting to sweat a little. You start to kind of reflect internally on what's going on. And then if I were to give you even more time, like when you take three to five minutes, what can start to happen is pretty powerful. And you can start to think about how others are doing and actually empathizing with them. And I'm gonna actually hop back to a screen to show you. What's really cool is you start to empathize um, when you get in this reflective mode where these default mode networks they're called, are active, you actually start seeing activity in some of these lower brainstem areas that actually are involved in keeping you alive, like your digestive, your gag reflex, your heart rate, your breath rate, um, monitoring kind of you know, where you are. And you can start to actually develop a greater sense of empathy for other individuals. And when I think of what we really need in this day and age right now, in uh, all that's going on with COVID, all that's going on with Black, Black Lives Matters, and thinking about the inequities that might be going on and that others might be feeling in our, in our contexts, to really sca scaffold empathy building and self-awareness with some quiet reflection in the middle of the day can be really powerful for all of us. You know, I think of my day-to-day -day as an educator and it was go, go, go. And you think of the day of the light, pay attention, go, go, go. And when we invite ourselves to rest and reflect, we actually get to some really powerful learning. So some really powerful opportunities. So I know this was a lot and there's a worked example you're welcome to take a look at. I have links, I have resources, you have access to the slides where all of the resources are hyperlinked. And so you can have at it. My goal was to try to just prime a few ideas for thinking about how we can scaffold student effort and persistence, knowing what we know about our learning brains. And maybe it'll help you a little in your own effort and persistence as we go through this really incredible fall. You know, this is unprecedented. And, um, and I wish you all the best. And let's work together, let's collaborate, let's share ideas and strategies. I already saw folks sharing strategies to get young kids to foster collaboration in online environments. You know, talk with each other, share how you're, you're scaffolding those, share how you're sharing model examples. Um, and please be in touch, you know, be in touch, reach out to me through email or Twitter. I'm on both of those. And um, there are resources to dive deeper. I have extra videos, extra. So please feel free to explore this. This was hopefully just a little teaser. So I'll, I'll hang out for a few more questions if you have them. And if not, have a great day. Thank you for being educators. Good luck this fall. I wish you the best. Thank you, Allison. That was really, really